without any further ado, here comes part two to Miss Temptation by Kurt Vonnegut. Just a quick recap, if you remember from the last video, uh, we got our good friend uh, Robert Fuller, who's back from the war. He berates the innocent Susanna for the crime of being pretty. And she decides to kind of up and leave. She's so upset. And the elderly Mr. Hinckley from the pharmacy is like, no, I have her papers. You should go deliver them to her yourself. And that's where we're at. So now Fuller and Susanna are going to confront each other. Let's see what happens. Part two. As he mounted the stairway to Susanna's nest, Fuller was almost spastic in his efforts to seem casual. Susanna's door was unlatched. When Fuller knocked on it, it swung open. In Fuller's imagination, her nest had been dark and still, reeking of incense, a labyrinth of heavy hangings and mirrors with somewhere a Turkish corner with somewhere a billowy bed in the form of a swan. He saw Susanna and her room in truth now. The truth was the cheerless truth of a dirt-cheap Yankee summer rental. Bare wood walls, three coat hooks, a linoleum rug, two gas burners, an iron cot, an ice box. A tiny sink with naked pipes, a plastic drinking glass, two plates, a murky mirror, a frying pan, a saucepan, a can of soap powder. The only harem touch was a white circle of talcum powder before the murky mirror. In the center of the circle were the prints of two bare feet. The marks of the toes were no bigger than pearls. Fuller looked from the pearls to the truth of Susanna. Her back was to him. She was packing the last of her things into a suitcase. She was now dressed for travel. Dressed as properly as a missionary's wife. <clears throat> papers, croaked Fuller. Mr. Hinckley sent them. How very nice of Mr. Hinckley, said Susanna. She turned. Tell him. No more words came. She recognized him. She pursed her lips and her small nose reddened. Papers, said Fuller emptily, from Mr. Hinckley. I heard you, she said. You just said that. Is that all you've got to say? Fuller flapped his hands limply at his sides. I'm, I, I, I didn't mean to make you leave, he said. I didn't, I didn't mean that. You suggest I stay? Said Susanna wretchedly. After I've been denounced in public as a scarlet woman? A tart? A wench? Holy smokes, I never called you those things, said Fuller. Did you ever stop to think what it's like to be me? She said. She patted her chest. There's something living inside here, too, you know. I know, said Fuller. He hadn't known up to then. I have a soul, she said. Sure you do, said Fuller, trembling. He trembled because the room was filled with a profound intimacy. He's scared. Susanna, the golden girl of a thousand tortured daydreams, was now discussing her soul passionately with Fuller the lonely, Fuller the homely, Fuller the bleak. I didn't sleep a wink last night because of you, said Susanna. Me? He wished she'd get out of his life again. He wished she were in black and white, a thousandth of an inch thick on, of, on a magazine page. He wished he could turn the page and read about baseball or foreign affairs. What did you expect? said Susanna. I talked to you all night. You know what I said to you? She didn't literally talk to him. She's saying, like, in her mind, like, she was upset and she's, you know. No, said Fuller, backing away. She followed and seemed to throw off heat like a big iron radiator. She was appallingly human. Imagine that. 
I'm not Yellowstone Park, she said. I'm not supported by taxes. I don't belong to everybody. You don't have any right to say anything about the way I look. Good gravy, said Fuller. I'm so tired of dumb toots like you, said Susanna. She stamped her foot and suddenly looked haggard. I can't help it if you want to kiss me. Whose fault is that? She's right. A fuller could now glimpse his side of the question only dimly, like a diver glimpsing the sun from the ocean floor. Yeah, all, all I was trying to say was, you could be a, a, a little more conservative, he said. Susanna opened her arms. Am I conservative enough now? She said, is this all right with you? The appeal of the lovely girl made the marrow of Fuller's bones ache, and his chest was a sigh like the lost chord. Yes, he said, and then he murmured, eh, forget about me. Susanna tossed her head. Forget about being run over by a truck, she said. What makes you so mean? I just say what I think, said Fuller. That's why keeping it real is not always the best option. You think such mean things, said Susanna, bewildered. Her eyes widened. All through high school, people like you would look at me as if they would wished I'd dropped dead. They'd never dance with me. They'd never talk to me. They'd never even smile back. She shuddered. They'd just go slinking around like small-town cops. They'd look at me the way you did, like I'd just done something terrible. The truth of the indictment made Fuller itch all over. Probably uh, thinking about something else, he said. I don't think so, said Susanna. You sure weren't. All of a sudden, you started yelling at me in the drugstore, and I'd never even seen you before. She burst into tears. What's the matter with you? Fuller looked down at the floor. I never had a chance with a girl like you. That's all, he said. That, that hurts. Susanna looked at him wonderingly. You don't know what a chance is, she said. A chance is a late model convertible. Check that. A chance is a late model convertible. A new suit and 20 bucks, said Fuller. Susanna turned her back to him and closed her suitcase. A chance is a girl, she said. You smile at her. You be friendly. You be glad she's a girl. She turned and opened her arms again. I'm a girl. Girls are shaped this way, she said. If men are nice to me and make me happy, I kiss them sometimes. Is that all right with you? Yes, said Fuller humbly. She had rubbed his nose in the sweet reason that governed the universe. He shrugged. I, I, I better be going. I, goodbye. Wait, she said. You can't do that. Just walk out leaving me feeling so wicked? She shook her head. I don't deserve to feel wicked. What can I do? Said Fuller helplessly. You can take me for a walk down the main street. As though you were proud of me, said Susanna. You can welcome, welcome me back to the human race. She nodded to herself. You owe that to me. He kind of took away her humanity. He turned her into an object. And his own confusing feelings about being attracted to her angered him. So to her, she's like, I'm not Yellowstone Park. I'm not like a monument. I'm not something that belongs to everybody. I'm not something that could be judged like that. I'm my own human individual person with rights. Oh my bad, I said Robert Fuller before. I meant Norman Fuller. Whoops. Corporal Norman Fuller, who had come home two nights before from 18 bleak months in Korea, waited on the porch outside Susanna's nest with all the village watching. Susanna had ordered him out while she changed, while she changed for her return to the human race. She had also called the express company and told them to bring her trunk back. Fuller passed the time by stroking Susanna's cat. 
Hello, kitty, 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 he said over and over again, saying, kitty, 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 numbed him like a merciful dog. He, he was saying it when Susanna came out of her nest. He couldn't stop saying it, and she had to take the cat away from him firmly before she could get him to look at her, to offer her arm. Susanna was barefoot, and she wore barbaric hoop earrings and ankle bells. Holding Fuller's arm lightly, she led him down the stairs and began her stately, undulating, titillating, tinkling walk past the liquor store, the insurance agency, the real estate office, the diner, the American Legion post, and the church to the crowded drugstore. Now smile and be nice, said Susanna. Show you're not ashamed of me. Mind, mind if I smoke, said Fuller. That's very considerate of you to ask, said Susanna. No, I don't mind at all. By steadying his right hand with his left, Corporal Fuller managed to light a cigar. The end. Just so we're clear, just because she takes his arm, she's not like suddenly dating him now or something. It's, no, it's deeper than that. He is confronted with the reality because she talks to him and makes him confront what he did, what he said. And now, kind of like a walk of shame, he has to show everybody that instead of saying sorry, I suppose, showing that he's sorry. This is pretty, you know, I don't want to say mind-blowing, but this is 19, this is, I believe the 1950s, from a male author writing about this deep hatred that a lot of men have towards women. I think we need more men having this conversation and teaching other men to have this conversation and what causes this hatred and how it's not, it's not the fault of women. It's the individual's fault, if there's any fault to be had. We all deserve love. Just don't twist it and get angry at others for not loving you back. That was Miss Temptation. Thank you for joining me for 7 p.m. stories. Have a good night and a better tomorrow.